The Tale of the Wandering Jew It's 12 a.m. in the morning, and here sits an elderly yet vigorous man in his Lower East Side New York apartment. The man is sitting at his study with Isaiah chapter 53 opened before his face as he thinks of a time that changed everything in his life. A man by the name of Mattathias is walking from his home to his workshop where he made sandals for the feet of first century Jews and also Gentiles, as Mattathias was so fond of calling those Romans who currently ruled and occupied his beloved homeland, Jerusalem. The day started out bright and beautiful, but as it dragged on and overcast began to move in, Mattathias was fond of taking the back alley streets that are so characteristic of his beloved homeland, in hopes that he might gather a few moments of silence. He loved to take those times to meditate on whatever portion of scripture he had heard that previous Sabbath. This particular week it had been a confusing passage of scripture concerning the suffering servant. This particular passage above all passages of Isaiah perplexed him and drew him into prolonged bouts of contemplation. A verse continued to come up in his spirit. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. However, on this particular day, time would not afford him this luxury. He was forced to take the main roads, which were always crowded, and on this day, even more so. As he continued, the amount of his fellow countrymen began to increase, and there was a sense of energy in the air that both excited him and also filled his soul with dread. As he drew nearer to the road leading out of the town, he saw the people lining both sides of the street. It was a crucifixion being performed by the Romans. He thought to himself, how barbaric. I understand justice must be served, but must they leave the corpse lay out and allow the birds of the air to feast upon the rotting flesh? How vile! and this close to Passover. As he walked along, he caught sight of three crosses being drug along the road. Two of them he recognized as common criminals, but the third he couldn't get a good view of, for multitudes had been surrounding him. Something was drawing him, an uncommon urge to know the identity of this soon-to-be crucified man. When he had finally made his way through the crowd, he came upon the man, yet his head was cast down. He gasped. The man's visage had been so marred by lashes that he was no longer recognizable, and carried about the top of his bloody head was a crown. But not a crown made fit for a king, but a savage, a wild man, a crown of thorns. He thought to himself once more, Truly this man has angered God above all other men that have come before him. And at that moment the man stopped, looked up and stared straight into the eyes of Mattathias, which seemed to pierce into his very soul. Then suddenly Mattathias recognized the man. It was the Galilean who has been wandering the countryside, supposedly performing miracles and being held as the coming Messiah, and instantly arose from his very depths a bitter disdain for such a man who would dare call himself our Messiah. Our Messiah, he thought to himself, will be one of great power and authority, He will come and dispel these barbaric Romans and will take back Jerusalem once and for all. And then suddenly, with a shout of rage and with aim to harshly reprove this deceiver, he yelled out, Go on now. Go on to the cross in which you deserve. There's no reason for you to hang around here any longer. Go and receive your just reward. And the man replied back calmly and with great sorrow in his eyes, I go, but you shall wait till I come again. Mattathias, struck by these words, at once thought about the suffering servant, and for a moment desired to fall to the ground and beg this man for his forgiveness. But as each second passed, the thought grew dimmer, and the thoughts of what the people might think crowded his mind. And so he walked away, leaving the sounds of the crowd behind him. He walked, and doing his utmost to keep the rivers of water from overflowing his eyes, and to put the rest the swirling whirlpool of emotions that tugged at his very heart. 
He finally walked into his home where he sat down by the oven fire which was normally used for cooking, but on this particular chilly day was used for warming. And he sat there and mused for a while, thinking over all that had just transpired, his emotions having now settled and his eyes now dry. His heart began to slow in its pace, and his hands began to ice over. At once he discerned an unusual phenomenon taking place in his body, yet he felt fine. And suddenly at that moment his wife and his two young children walked into the small common home and his attention was at once turned upon them. The thought of his wife's face and his two little children immediately drew him back into the moment, back into his apartment. At once reality set in and he began to weep. A tear fell from his eye and splashed upon the pages of Isaiah's prophecy. Through his tear-stained eyes he could read, He is despised and rejected by man a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Isaiah 53, 3 Yet his tears were not for this man, the suffering servant, but for himself and all he had lost over the last two millennia, a wife, children, grandchildren, all lost to the sands of time, town after town, generation after generation, gone. Yet here he remained doomed to wander the earth until at last he should see those penetrating eyes once again. And oh, how he feared those eyes. Now the legend of the wandering Jew has no basis in the Bible. It is a fable that has borrowed some of its elements from the Bible, including a mention of Jesus. But it is a fictional story. During his trial and crucifixion, Jesus was indeed mocked on the road to Calvary. However, we have no record of anyone mistreating him. Luke 23:27 records that women from Jerusalem bewailed and cried for him, and in his response, Jesus never spoke a curse on anyone. In all he said, he was an example of grace and truth. When he was attacked and humiliated by Roman soldiers, he didn't re- retaliate. Matthew chapter 27 verses 27 through 31. When false accusers lied against him, Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Mark 14:61. Any supposed interaction with the man who mocked him, with Jesus cursing him, is simply a myth. However, this we have as truth. Isaiah 53, 7 He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth.